Hi everybody and welcome to my channel. Today I've got Wayne on who's coming to uh, share his story to tell us all about his time in Franklin prison and other establishments. But well, Wayne was actually in Franklin at the same time as me, but he was on the DSPD unit, which stands for the Dangerous... What is it, Wayne? Dangerous and Severe Personality Disorder. So Wayne was on this unit at the same time that I was in Franklin. But um, I'll just hand over to Wayne if you'd just like to introduce yourself. All right, I'm, I'm Wayne Bates from Sunderland. Uh, I'm 42 and I've just come on uh, Ricky's podcast to share my story and explore like my yeah. life sort of thing. So Wayne's come out the day to tell us his story about his time in prison. But well, Wayne's actually been out of prison for 12 years now, which is a massive achievement for him because he never lasted longer than 12 months, did he, Wayne? Yeah, that's right, man. It's... Uh... It's nothing to be proud of, but like from the age of, well, exactly on my 15th birthday, <clears throat> I was actually up on the, I was actually up on the 15th of April and the judge adjourned it till the 18th of April till it was my 15th birthday. Right. And I got three months. And from there, like I was saying, it's similar to your story. It, it wasn't really a big thing going into jail. Yeah. I'd heard of my mates being in prison and stuff like that. So it was like, I wanted to go to see what it was like myself. Yeah. Crazy thought at 15, I look at some of the 15 year olds these days and it's like, prison is not a good place no. for you, you know. So, it's just the way you're brought up sometimes, isn't it? The I, environment you're in. Your core the beliefs. People, your core beliefs, the people you look up to when you're a youngster. But we will get into that a bit later on. But um, Wayne, whereabouts were you born and where did you grow up? Well, I was born in Sunland Hospital. Like, bless me, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Sunderland Hospital, um, raised in Doxford Park, Sunderland. It's been, since been knocked down, flattened, and new houses built. But right. we, we moved. We then moved to fence houses in Hortney Spring, and from the age of fourteen, and I suppose that's where I started branching out in in yeah. being, uh, you know, a little terror. So, what was life like before you moved into fence houses and? Yeah, I think it was quite stable. We had we had a better than most kids on the estate. Um, I did you the, live with your mum and dad? Yeah, I my mum and my dad, uh, two sisters, two brothers, uh, two younger brothers, a younger sister, and one older sister. Um, and basically, my mum and my dad were married together. Um, it was quite quite volatile between them. You know what right. I mean? So. Yeah. Like, we'd hear bits and bobs of fighting, you know, my dad used to tap the belt to me, which I look at now, you know, I've given him whatever, you know, he's died. I didn't go into his funeral. But I regret not going because I've never seen my brother, who's since passed away in prison, you know, which is a big regret. But getting back on the subject, what were you saying, sorry? Just what was life like growing up when you were a youngster, um, before you moved to fence houses? Uh, it, well, what like, happened? What happened for the move? The, um, my mum and dad broke up. Um, my dad went somewhere I didn't know, and mum, I suspect he might went to prison. But apparently, he was on the oil rigs. Right. You know, I'm so, But anyways, um, like I was saving money out of an envelope, which is up top in the top cut. I ended up taking two grand while my dad was away. So he's come back. Me not knowing any different. You know what I mean? I was just a kid, and I was just like wasting money, like setting twenty pound notes out and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, uh, my mum and dad ended up having a big fight, it broke up. No, my mum had already broke up, she already told them, you know what I mean? So I'd, it was, obviously it was sick of the violence and stuff like that. And they broke up, my mum moved to fence houses, my dad went somewhere else, and I ended up staying in the family house by myself, right. like with a left, just with me hi-fi, you know what I mean? I was getting rang off the neighbours and everything. My mum was trying to get us out of there. My dad just weren't interested really, you know what I mean? He was doing his own thing. But my mum was trying to pull us out of Horton fence houses and I'm like, nah, I'm having not deal, not coming okay. over there, I didn't know anybody. But I ended up going over and my mum introduced us to somebody over there who was one of the lads, you know what I mean? And I just ended up like knotting about with him and like just started going down the wrong tracks. And that's when you were like a teenager, was I? I was I was already 14, 15, I was already heading down them tracks, it's just he was an older right. lad, you know what I mean? So I sort of like looked up and and it was one of the boys up there, so I kept him with him. So when you were younger, like before you had your teenage years and stuff, and it was like obviously the bigger lads in the areas getting up to all sorts, did you used to look up to these sort of people? Yeah, I did. Uh, it was exciting. Oh, right. Because I used to tune from school. I didn't know about you, but 
I got put in um, one of them nautical schools. No, where, oh, right, yeah. for, for difficult behaviours and sort of find a different a different method of teaching. Yeah. And I see it with like, activities and stuff. Um, I I was like dolling off all the time, and obviously these lads were in that sort of circle where you'd hear about oh this person's been to jail, that person pinched a car, went to jail. Oh, yeah. Well, I was pinching cars at the time, you know. So it was the people around us that hear this and that. So when I was fifteen, and went to prison. I was literally. Walk, I remember vividly in my head, right, walking up the day wing from reception and my kit bag was, was bigger than me in Diabold. Diabold. Aye. My kit bag was bigger than me. I see people marching around the yard and that, like the three oh, times with your man at the research. So it was like a proper detention centre then. You had to throw all your big pads up and that every morning. But I remember walking up there uh, from reception, the kit bag was literally bigger than me. No, the mat was covered. Well, aye. aye. With all your stuff in Aye. And I was like, look, look, what the wing, and I just said, BAT! And I'm like, oh, there's such and such, and straight away, I'm like, I was more excited than oh, worried, yeah. you know, which is which is a concern. Yeah. So obviously, going into prison like that, there's someone shouting in your name. You just thought, yes, yeah, so you just think it's a funny game. You, games you just think you're back on the streets in, in somewhere else, but just somewhere else. But, you, you know, it is daunting, like, when you just get that clank behind you all the first time you're getting that door shut, and the smell when you're going into prison, that disinfecting oh, smell. So leading up to that, then before you got to prison, what sort of things were you doing? Getting in trouble with the police? Were you? You were just mentioned yeah, like was, you were like I was cough, pinching I was cars, pin, pinching cars, um, just just general naughty lad stuff. No, well, I say general. It's not general, is it? Yeah, when right. you think about it, but just like the not, typical sort of things that happens on these type of eye, estates and stuff. and pinching, fighting. You know, robbing, robbing lads. No, it's just the statement that you've said there. Typical stuff, but that's it's in the areas us. that you grew up in. Everyone's doing that around you. All like, all your peers and your older lads are doing it. So you just think it's normal. Yeah, you think that's just the next route yeah. of life, isn't it? So, and to get to that next stage, you're in the naughty boy school. You want to go to prison. You get to prison, and it's just like it's not a deterrent, is it? No, no. Yes, it's like you, you get out and you see it as like a little holiday because you know you're in your head. You're going yeah. back in. Oh. And I've got to the point where I was that much of a revolving door. The schools used to be like. We'll keep your pad warm for you, especially in Lord Newton oh, because it was on my doorstep. We were like, yeah, we'll keep your cell warm for you. And I used to laugh at them and say, I'm not coming back, you know what I mean? But the next day I'd be back in and be like, ah, oh, we've got your cell for you. Oh, and it'd be like, you know what, his wife fight it. <laughs> you know, and I just, I ended up being institutionalised, me, by the time I was 19, 20. You know, so a couple of years of in and out, in and out, I was just institutionalised and I didn't want to get out. I was that. Determined not to get out, I was doing really bad stuff in prison to increase my sentence. So you just wanted Aye. to stay in prison? Yeah. Why do you think that was? And do you think you felt more comfortable in there? Or was Aye, it? Yeah, I was much more comfortable in there because I was and comfortable around violence and things like that. It's a bad thing to look at, and but everybody's the same. You, you know, so we didn't need to adjust to people out yeah. here, white collar people, everybody's the same. So I felt like I was just going back to my mates. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Because there was one or two outside, but inside it was loads. Everybody knew you, you were popular. You know, if you were doing your thing, people used to like look and you know, you didn't have that same sort of yeah. consistency outside. But in your head, like you're saying, I've, I've been that, in that mentality myself where you think it's just one big game. You didn't know any different, but it's I, like, again, it's because of the way or the area that you've grew up in and it's not, it doesn't phase you. It's not out of place, is it? Oh, okay. You know what I mean? So you're just trying to blend in with your environment and you're doing what you can to survive, to get to get older, you know? Because it's like we used to walk to school, we'd be in fights before we went to school. We went to school, I'd be in the headmaster's office getting lashed across my legs off the headmaster, you know what, <laughs> what I mean? I'd get home and I'd get, I'd get wrong for great being wrong at school. So it was just boom, boom, boom and then I never started fighting until I was like 15, 16. I was just, I used to like fighting back. I just used oh, to get hit a lot. Right. You know what I mean? And then I started fighting back. And then once I realised that, obviously training in jail and stuff yeah. like that, oh, that's in my head, that's what I became. And I became this vengeful, like horrible person, you know what I mean? I was like remembering every single slight, everybody that hadn't done it was, and I made a point of going around every single, not every single person because there's people, who, yeah. who we've just agreed to disagree and but that is a mature adult when you're a kid you didn't look like that yeah but it's just i went i went around i got my button i was like why didn't i do that was it when i was a kid and then i started looking at me myself you know what i mean i'm like yeah. well i've just put myself in that position and i've just 
I've just had the intent to literally kill that person and it never happened. Everybody stood back and then just peeled away and it was like, I want to go to jail. So I just ran, I went on this mad rampage with Samurai Sword and a knife just to go to jail. I was with somebody beforehand fighting because they were fighting and a gun got pulled out and it was just getting madder and madder and madder on the full street. And then... So when you're speaking about this, is this... Was this someone like you? Uh, this was in Fence Houses, see, because when, we moved, when I moved from Sunderland, I was back a bit, sorry, I was back a bit worse, but when, I moved, when we moved to Sunderland, when we moved from Fence Houses to Sunderland, it's like we were called townies and we were targeted a lot because of the way we walk or the way yeah. we talked, you know what I mean? I was only 14, I was the eldest lad of the family, so I felt I had to stick from my brothers and right. sisters and that as well. So I, it was just basically because we were picked on by the older lads as well, you know, the lads like you used to look at you, it was like they take things off you and, you know, and just like, because I was a money maker, you know what I mean? I always used to, I always used to be a grafter and make money and, People take advantage of that, man. You were kids, you didn't know, but you just want to impress, yeah. so you know what I mean? So, so was there, a, like you've mentioned, <clears throat> did you notice like it was a lot more violence involved after you'd been to prison? You come out and well, were you being more violent? Actually, it's funny, it's funny you should uh, say that because there was a really pivotal moment where even my mum says I just turned violent, and it's got to do, it's I, I, I was in a car crash sniffing gas. When I was when I was uh, fifteen, my mum and dad already split up. I, I was fifteen and I crashed into the lamppost. The lamppost came down, and crushed us in the car, and I was in a coma. And two weeks later, I woke up, not knowing not knowing anything. My mum was there, and she was like, "When do you know?" And I'm like, "No." And I say, "I'm upset, you God." My dad come in the room. I recognised my dad. You know what I mean? My dad was quite violent. Oh, you know right. what I mean? So like because I've looked at myself on the DSP Dean and brought myself down. That was why I turned violent because I looked at that and thought violence has always remembered. You know, people always remember violence, people yeah. being nice. Nice, my mum, I never recognised the violence without I recognised. And that, that, was the, that was the core belief I had. Right. You know what I mean? So, at the so time. You obviously, when you were that age, you thought violence was the answer. I, well, you mentioned when you were growing up, you're like, you've seen a lot of violence growing up. Yeah, I. So, have you seen a lot of violence? And that's how you sometimes end up that way because you think that violence is the answer. But it is, isn't it? Yeah. That's exactly right, mate. Exactly right. So what age were you when you got this this last sentence then? Um, I was 20, 23. 23? 20, 23 I was. Uh, just so well, leading up to this, obviously, you've done a load of different sentences and stuff. Yeah. yeah um, were you involved in drinking and drugs? No, I, I, I never used to drink. Um, I've, I've never really drank. I've smoked pot, like weed and that yeah. stuff like that. I've dabbled, I've tried just about everything, but my choice is cannabis, you know what I mean? Right. I've smoked that, everybody knows. But um, <clears throat> it was, it was, um, it, it was that moment, and then we moved to Fence, we moved to Fence House, and that moment there, now what led up that moment of me running away with a samurai and wanting to go to prison? Yeah because I was at the end of getting all these people back. And that last fight there was with the last person. So I then had no more goals. So I was right. like, well, where do I go next to? Do I go and say, now I'm in this fucking craze. Yeah. Like, suppose I swim, but now I'm in this fucking manic. Who do I go and say now? Yeah. And then I just was like, you know, I'm going to, I've just nearly killed somebody. I've, I'm going to kill somebody. I want to get to prison. I just started waving the sword about, like just kicking people's doors in, just, Kind of tapping them hostage just to get into prison. How crazy is that, man? Well, like you say, you've you went to prison and you've turned your life around. You've never been back after that sentence. Luckily, but we'll talk luckily, about aye, we'll luckily. talk about a lot of things leading up to that. But um, so when you were, you mentioned about the samurai attack and stuff, was that what sentence did you get for that? Um, I got I got eight years for that, and then I got another a three, another three year consecutive on top of that for a separate incident. So I ended up with like 11 year consec and a five year extended license. But like I said, my head weren't in a good place. And I actually wrote the judge a letter saying, listen, I'm, I'm a dangerous society, pose in prison for life. And I was lucky because I just missed the IPP. That's right. what my solicitor said, because he gives the 11 year. And I was like, is that it? I was literally in the gallery going, is that it? What are you doing? And I went back down, Jerry says, you really look right, you missed IPV. I'm like, I'm not fucking bothered. You know what I mean? I want to be yeah. like, oh, now I know what it's all about. Well, and now I know, now oh, I know all the lads <laughs> who spent oh. like eight years out of tariffing, 
I wouldn't wish Luckily, on anybody. You didn't get it, especially oh, you know. if you landed on the DSPD. I would never have been. I would never have got out ever. So what year was that when you got sentenced? Um, it was July two thousand and three. I think it was July two thousand and three. Oh no, wait there. That was my offence when it happened. Because I think the IPPs came out in two thousand and five. I so. and then I got sentenced in two thousand in November two thousand and three, and apparently we were. The beginning of November and the end of November, that's when they brought in the IPP, right. 2003. So I like I seriously missed it by like a couple of weeks. Like So you, you were know. doing, 11, was it 11 years altogether? Aye, uh, 11 years. And at that time, was it still three quarters? <coughs> Aye. Uh, uh, two third, thirds, sorry. Third eye. Uh, two thirds. So it was like I had like eight, eight, eight months to serve. So eight, 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 eight months. And, uh, and what age were you then? 20. I was 23. So 23 year old. Wait, any any age getting a sentence, but it's a big sentence when you look at it. Eight yeah. and a half years to uh, do out of anyone's life. It's, but a, it's a substantial amount. Like you've just mentioned, when you were saying to the judge, you wanted to be lifed off, you wanted to get a bigger sentence. You'll have seen when you were watching my story, I was the same when they, when I got locked up at the police station for a violent offence, or I admitted to it, uh, and they let us out, and I was saying, <coughs> what are you doing letting us out? Uh, so I've told you, yeah. I'm, this isn't stopping here, so... It sounds like we're on similar paths well, that's, because that's, of that's what we've why, seen. I, well, that's why when I started seeing your podcast, I was like, you know what is it? It's very similar, like our thought patterns, you know what yeah. I mean, and which journeys we've took. It's crazy, I think. But it's good that, like you say, we've come together, we've connected, <laughs> yeah. and we've connected in a positive way Yes. to share but, our story I, and tell, hopefully, show the youngsters that are in that mindset. That's that what I mean. Do you want to look like exactly. me? Exactly. Like, mm, I don't think it's so. a waste of life, isn't it? <laughs> Aye, it is. But at least we're out here now, yeah, talking about well, if it. It's that one, even if it's that, I, even if it's that one person, you know, it's worth it. Of course. Because you, I've, I've helped that one person before. That's what keeps me going, yeah. and that's what drives me forward. Because I know I've actually helped someone. Right. And I've done that through having his attention sitting on the side of the bank fishing and just drilling it into his head. Listen, I was this age. Yeah. Don't do this. You shouldn't do that. And and he actually listened to his tough things on board and he's... And it's actually worked I, with good hats off to you. Aye, cheers, mate. I've seen him progress. But then on the other hand, I've tried to help people and I've seen them degrade, you know what I mean? And that's, yeah. not, that's not good to watch, it's disheartening. And... But at least you've tried and Aye. there's been someone there. Because obviously, when we were youngsters, there wasn't any good role models. And that's no, how we ultimately not. went down the path we did. My my role model was actually a car thief. Was it? Who lived opposite my mum, yeah. You'll know who that is. <laughs> you know what I mean? If he's watching, you know who that is. I ain't mentioning that. <laughs> so where did you go when you got your sentence then? Um, I went straight to Durham, and I wasn't like I wasn't allowed to sell me it because obviously me and me and offences. So right. I was a single cell in Durham, <coughs> and then my bro my brother come in who was co accused of it, it off me other offence, uh, who sadly passed away now. He was co accused with, and the so they put us in with him, like my brother with Daniel. And uh, me, I was I was like just I was just waiting to get shipped out at the time. You know, I was just trying to relax, accept my yeah. sentence, and get on with my time. You know, but old Daniel was bouncing about all over the place. You know, I was I had people coming to us saying, "Oh, you have a was have he a brother similar to you? Was he? Yeah, oh, I, I was like, "Have a word with him. I'm going to have to give him a clip." You know what I mean? It's like you're not like <laughs> you know what I mean, and then you just end up, you know, and then. The, the screws at the time, because they didn't want to put me on basic in case I kicked off, because I had a big sent I had a big sentence in Durham at the time, and there's not many people hang about with big sentences. Yeah. And um, I remember at the time they put my brother on basic, and they put me on basic because of what my brother done, because right. I was paddling oh. with him. I just took his telly and all of him. So then, and then when we come up that, they put my brother on basic, and then this like shipped us both out. You know, I've, well, just for the viewers, when you get put on basic in prison, that means you get. No privileges, you Basic get your TV privileges. took off you. You get two pound a week to spend on your canteen uh, and yeah. phone. You're not allowed visits, or maybe it's one a month. I uh, shower yeah. every three days. Uh, I shower <laughs> every three days. Not allowed out your pad at all. It's like being in the block uh, and a block park, uh, still on the wing. I uh, so I ended up putting us both on base and shipped us out. I went to Loudon Grange, down Nottingham, my brother went to Ackland. Was that Loudon, uh, the private nickname? Uh, I thought it was a private jail at the time, like, it was like. What was it like going there? Because Loudham Grange is a Cat B prison, and that's yeah. Yeah, Cat C. Was it Cat C? I think. No, no, it was a Cat B was at it? the time. I, f I know it's Cat B still now, I. And, and they put Sensees out from there, didn't they? Right, I. Right. 
So I um I was cut C, cut B and C oh, mixed, you know. But it was it was good and uh, like like the jobs weren't prison pay jobs, it was like I went to the shop, a clothes hanger shop, just to pay the labels off, and it's like 70 quid a week. Was it? No, you worked on price, you know what I mean? So we'd be hiding the boxes, and, like taking the people's boxes, hiding <laughs> them up, tapping the labels off and stuff like that. And I, I wasn't there long, like, I was there about six weeks, and I ended up down the block and getting bored. So, so during this, these sentences and stuff, did you ever go to the doctors and that? Because obviously... Yeah. Have you, you've got a personality disorder, have you? Yeah, I've... I've is it. that something that stays with you for, yeah, forever? Yeah, I, I, like. something that's diagnosed. You've, literally, you've got to see a psychologist and a psychiatrist, and then the main psychiatrist diagnoses you. So but, was this ever known before? No. Before we get rid, obviously, we get further on, but when you were in the prison, you no, were... Huh? No, well, it, what, they, weren't, they weren't found 2005 is when, is when I got diagnosed mm -hmm. with these got, disorders. Right. Beforehand, it was just like I was just a control issue with the problem, you yeah. know. But I just, it's how I am. I'm like, it's like yeah. constant. I'm like this in here. I'll be like this in, in the magistrate court. I, you know, I'm, I just right. bounce about. That's just how, how I am. So, what happened to Loudham then? Did you stay there long? I, uh, well, I was about there uh, for about six weeks and I, I ended up, like, I ended up getting put onto this different medication because. I was struggling with my mood at the time. My mood, I was like, I just, it was bouncing all over the place and I just, I couldn't sleep because of it and it was just getting on my mind a bit. So we were trying this out with these medications and they put us on this medication called Siroxat, um, Siroxidine. Right. In America, it's banned under your annuals and I, it's like watching somebody else. Even at the time, I didn't feel it was me. I've walked in myself, came back from work, walked myself. I've, I've turned around, walked out myself, walked up to the PO's office and just like, just ended up going crazy and tapping them hostage. Like I've booted his desk against the window, pinned him up against the window and ragged the filing cabinet down. And before you know it, like I had, I had, this, I had the PO hostage and negotiators outside and stuff and like that. was this in Loudoun Grange? I was at Loudoun Grange. I mean, the, the poor officers, like the turnover in there was ridiculous, you know what I mean? It was like a new officer every two weeks. So it'll have just been, like you say, it's a private prison, so it's just normal people. Yeah. Not hardened screws like in Franklin, oh, because yeah. it's block screws, segregation screws, it's all hard fuckers, aren't they? But in there, it's just like, it's just like a shopkeeper. Right. You know what I mean? And they didn't know what Not they properly doing. trained. And it shows, right. uh, it shows, man. Apart from the people with titles like governor and stuff like that. So do you think the medication was making you, making you worse? Yeah. I've never, I've, I left medication behind when I got up to prison, 12 years ago. I've never been back in prison. Because you mentioned this one, because you mentioned before, like, <coughs> it was a... Uh, did you say it was banned in America? Or was yeah, on... banned in America, um, siroxidine. It's, uh, it's generally it's called siroxat. And it's, uh, it, gives you, it gives you heightened emotion. So if you're feeling depressed, it's going to make you feel even more depressed. If you're feeling angry or anxious, it's going to make you feel even more angry or anxious. That's in the first two weeks. We never explained none of this. So it was just like, hey, there's a pill, take it, be quiet. And when you, you took the I mean? screw hostage, was there any thought behind it or was it just no, something you just... No, it was just a, just a an completely irrational decision. random, irrational, irresponsible decision. So uh, talk us through this, what happened then when you took the screw hostage? Um, <clears throat> I didn't even know what I want. I didn't even know what I wanted, man. It's like, once I was in, once I was in there, it was like, Huh, oh, man, get the kettle on here. I'm jumping on the phone and that, you know what I mean? And the screw is like in the corner, like, and I'm trying to relax him. I'm like, hey, mate, do you want a cup? And like, listen, it's not going to last long, you know what I mean? I'll let, I'm going to let you, I'm not going to hurt you, you know what I mean? I'm, I just, and it was like, I didn't know what I wanted, you know what I mean? So I'm like, wait, how about we we'll play this game? I'll play Monopoly with him. And it's like, and I could see he was really tense doing it. You know what I mean? But he was involving himself and, and I was trying to take his mind off the fact that he was in here with me. You know what I mean? Because... And what was going on outside the room then? Um, I, had the host, I had the negotiators and the screws and all like that, like trying to jack the door and that, but I had the filing cabinet under the hinges so we couldn't. And it was after about four hours, after about four hours, it's like um, loads of screws around the whole wing and all the rag game and all the shields. Yeah. This is the whole wing of alone, you know. And I started banging the shades off all the windows. So I'm at the window going, what he's doing, what he's doing. In the meantime, we're trying to get through the door. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And uh, 
So I'm like, and then I was like, I was, just, I was playing games with him at the time, and I was like, listen, get these next five questions right, and I'll let you out. Thinking, well, that's a decision made, don't let and let him out. Four questions, and he got the last question wrong. It's not, it's not funny. It's like I've probably traumatised him for the rest of his life. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not funny. He got the last question wrong. But in my sick, satisfied mind, that was my reason for keeping him in for another 45 minutes. And you were saying when I was speaking to you earlier on, that you wanted him to get the question right, didn't I, you? I wanted really it. wanted him. I was like, I was So did you hints. feel as if it was two different people on the side of your fight? I, like, yeah. One of you wanted to let him go and the other one had him for I, It's like the reason. devil in the shoulder and they're the both controlling you. You know what I mean? It's like one minute I'll be sitting there and, and is, it, is this what it, it's like having a personality disorder? Uh, is it like is it? Yeah, too? yeah. You've always got that negative and the positive, and then you've always got your beliefs. Right. So you've got you like because you are neither uh, an overthinker like me. So it's like you probably just come across it. You, but really, when you draw get things down to it, it's just your mind telling you all of these different options. Different options are doing you. But when you didn't know any better, you didn't know what's going on. You're oh, just trying to please and be quiet. <laughs> so what happened after the? Um, after that, I, after that, I've got. How long was did you leave him for until he got out? Till you released him? Um, it was four hours and forty five minutes, and then, and then I, and then that's when things started getting tough for me in jail. Like that's that's when things started to come down on me bad, man. No, I, mean, I was down at the. Did you get a good beating on the way uh, on the block? No, no, on the way cameras, everything. Both and beyond in, in Nottingham. Right. You know what I mean? Then the shift is to full Sutton block. Right. You know what I mean? And I was down full Sutton block, man. It's, there's no rules, man. Full, you know I mean? full <laughs> Sutton is a high security uh, prison. Some would have had dispersal. toughened screws in the block there, did they? Yeah, why well, Charles Bronson was down at the time. Was he, he? he was next door to his eye. And uh, there was another. What happened on your, on your arrival to the, into the block then? Um, well, you. you I didn't come in reception. I, I came in straight, the van went straight to the block and I got let out from there, like with, in the line, you know, when you walk through the line, the middle of the line, you've got all the screws, yeah. you, might, you might know, but I'll stand there and the right gear you in that all tough and that while you walk down the middle of the block, like handcuffed up, like two on each arm and, that, and the dogs and everything barking. That's, that was me arrival in full sudden, you know what I mean? I, I felt like a high security prisoner, you know what I mean? It was like, shit. Shit's getting real I, now. Shit's <laughs> getting real now. And I was down that Did you block. feel a bit scared on the way now? I, I was a bit worried about what sort of beatings I would get off the screw, how much I would twist things up a bit like, but I suppose after a while, you know, you just, you get used to it. You know what I mean? You get used to them thoughts and you get used to that door gun. You know what I mean? And you're getting rushed off the of screws. But it stopped. Like, I was get like, three o'clock in the morning, man, making my dog come in. You know what I mean? The screws would come in, just twisting us up with mattress on us, beating us and stuff like that. And it's like, do you know what it is? I didn't even know what I was doing. You know what I mean? Oh. So I was sitting there, I was, I was paying for this, you know what I mean? In physical pain, you know? And in the end, I ended up shitting up. You know what I mean? I was reading these books down the block and it was like, in one of the books, one of the prisoners shit up and the screws left him alone, you know what I mean? So I was like, no, what is fuck you, man? And I thought, I can't talk anymore, I can't even sleep. I mean, I shut my eyes, in my fucking cell, you know what I mean? Sorry for swearing, you in my cell. No, it's all right, you can swear, man. And then, and then uh, I just got sick with after, after about, I would say about five months, because I had a good, so I was on back wall unlock as well. So, like, every time the screws come to the door, I had to stand up the back of the cell, face the cell, like, in my box, you saw right. face the window. And all the days, slide something under the door, like my food or something, every meal time. But that stopped after about after I shit up. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so then, how long were you in there then, in that block? For, uh, eight months. Eight months. Uh, eight months in a, as if a fucking long time to spend. The governor block. used to bypass my cell, you know. <laughs> you, you know when you see on telly like everything's legit, a check on every prisoner. No nah, shit, man. They'll bypass your cell if they want to, mate. You know what I mean? It's. But I suppose that's like. That's like me attacking them, and yeah. they're looking at us. Well, you're attacking us because I was, I was I trying was, to make an example so I, you don't do it again. Yeah, and it wasn't just that; it was like sometimes because it's quiet on the dinner. When I got on, um, when I got on F wing full sudden, the tellers that could hear somebody getting beat down the block with this mattress on them. Oh. You know what I mean? Because they hear the slap of the mattress all the time. Like, uh, it's going to be like for half an hour straight over dinner, man. I'm battling bruised, but. No broke, and out like that, oh, you know what I mean? And I didn't complain, but in the end, I just fucking shit up, man. I had to, 
So when you shit up for just for the views, when you do that, it's obviously means you rub yeah. your own shit all over. Ba you. Basically, I just had a stool on the floor and I just rubbed my feces all over myself and I was standing at the back of the cell for when I come in, so I'd fling shit at them, to keep them away from us because I was just hurt. Were you not pain. being sick when you were doing that? No, it was giving us a sense like of satisfaction. No, was it? Right? You get the smell. You put some under your lip there and it just gans. The smell gans. <laughs> you get used to it. I. <laughs> it's just. I mean, it's disgusting to think I've been covered in human feces, but. The things you'll do to survive when you're in that situation and you've got only you to count on, you'll do anything. So obviously you've just mentioned you were doing this to stop you from getting beat up off the screws. Yeah, that was exactly it. So it was Charles Bronson next door to you at the time, was he, it? He was, I and, and I, and I still find it funny to this day because I used to tell, like, we would, we, he'd ask us questions, random questions at the pipe, like my name, like, why am I down the block and stuff like that? And I, and I had him giggling loads, you know, telling him what I'd been doing with the screws and that <laughs> because I've read in some of his books, he's done similar things, you know what I mean? Oh, so I was like, oh my dears, I'm high security, I'm next to, Char <laughs> I'm next to Charles <laughs> Bronson, how good can I get, you know what I mean? Because that's like, what I thought at the time, like, how good can I get, I've made it, you know what <laughs> I mean? <laughs> so I was sitting well, chatting with him <laughs> and, and it was like he was writing stuff down, you know what I mean? As if it was, it was like for the build, but it began an exercise, like, because we took the high security ones went on, like, after everybody else, because I had to get the dogs and kit it up and stuff like that. So me and him used to be an exercise and we used to, like, we'd chuck things our, not just a chain, like, some, he had a water bottle in the thing, but the screws wouldn't take it off him. And he used to chuck that and be like, send us that back. And we used to, like, literally just loads of times, just chucking this big, heavy five litre out of oh, the fence, you know what I mean? But it works you out. He's obviously into loads of workouts oh, and stuff. But, like, I'm not proud of the fact it's just something factual, of what's course, actually sorry. happened, you know what I mean? Well, like you've just mentioned, again, <clears throat> you've got into the block, you're next door to Charles Bronson, in that mindset, you're thinking, yes, I've made it. E exactly. And it just goes to exactly. show how far your mind can actually be gone when you, you, you think you've made it because you're in the block of the shit next door to Charles I Bronson. Know, I, exactly, Crazy, I, I, and, I, and it's like, actually, look oh, at that situation, it's like, you've made it anywhere, mate, you haven't even made out the block. But I bet when you look back at yourself, you're thinking, who the fuck was that? I, 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 I do, like I, I do, really, it's oh, like, you didn't know who that, it's like, when people It's like talking, somebody else when you look I, at your past, and you're thinking... Especially when people have mentioned, like, oh, yeah, remember when you've done this, and it's like, Oh, I can't remember, and it's like, what do you think? And it's like, I've, I actually, when I came up with DSP, doing that's what we do, we break it down. So you've so you've looked at everything in your whole life, you know what I mean? We break it down right to the bare souls, man, and then they just leave you to struggle. This, yeah. is, this is part of their process. They leave you to struggle and figure yourself out, figure it out yourself, because you've got to want it to move yeah. up to the next level. And that's why you start soaking everything up. But you've got to, like you say, the key right. thing, you've got to want. You've got to want a change. You've got to want that change to be able to make it progressive yeah. and positive. But well, getting back to the block, <clears throat> um, after eight months, what happened then? Um, Did they just come to you and... No, no, after eight months, the listener from F-Wing started coming down, who was one of the... When I got on F-Wing, I found out he was one of the lads from Sunderland. Because right. he found out I was down the block. Obviously, the heat of stuff going on down the block, right. so he's like, what's going on down here? Finds that I'm down here and he's like, chatting as well, I'm going to try and get you up the wing and that. You know, it was a high security wing I went on, you know, with all the cameras and that. Oh, right, because sorry. I wouldn't pose on the other wings because I was in the shoe, you know. And then I got talking to the listener and I, I got to bring us a couple of smokes and that down. And got talking to him, got friends with him and he just convinced the screws to let us up on the F wing. You know, right. with all the cameras and that were keeping eye on us. And I spent about, I didn't spend that long up there, I spent about, Five to six months up there, and but during the time I was down the block and going up there, I was getting assessed for the DSPD unit. Right. You know what I mean? So we were looking at the Zen, like while I was down the block. At the time, did they say there's five security, high security prisons in there? I, um, was, um, I don't think, not all of them's got the DSPD, have they? No, there's only um, Whitemore and Franklin. There's it? only two DSP systems. DSPD systems in the uh, prison estate. There is ones outside of the estate. Because um, it was called as Westgate, wasn't it? Aye, the Westgate, the pipes the Westgate unit. unit. Well, was it unit? called the Pipes Unit when you were there or not? The Pipes Unit. Because that's what they call it. Now it's called there. Uh, it's is not it? called Westgate. It's oh, called a, um, a Pipes Unit. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. A aye. lot of the, a lot of the, like the mental health wings are now called like a Pipes Unit. Aye. 
Oh, I'm not right. sure what the pipe actually stands for, but it's just, that's what they are now. I'm going to have to look, have a look into that yeah. pipe when I get back home, mate. It's yeah. still the same sort of thing that's going on. Is it still the, the same sort of oh, different name for different it? Different name, because I, I knew someone not so long back that was here in Franklin who was on a, when he called it the pipes unit, because obviously I knew it as Westgate, Westgate as well. Yeah. It was called Westgate Wing on it. I, th I thought we'd turn that into <coughs> a terrorist unit. Like No, that's down at, um, that's near the block. Aye, uh, oh, like down the bottom. Down the bottom, aye. Right. There was some naughty people up at DSPD, you know what I mean? Aye. Oh, like so did you go there from people. Full Sutton then? Aye, oh, I, went, I went there from Full Sutton, but when I landed on the unit, it was only like me and George on there, and George like a lifer from down Peterborough. And uh, it was only me and him on the unit. Out so how many spaces were there on this unit then? Um, 20 people per unit, four units. Right. Um, all single cells. I uh, saw so it was like... Exactly 20 people per unit, but the unit they always used to keep a couple of beds per unit for the people who were moving between units. You know, so it was four units, 20 cells each unit. They had the one education facilities on gym. Did you mix with the care. other units or were you all separate? No, no, you just mix with other units sometimes on exercise, gym, whatever, you're not know, education, stuff like that, because everybody, everything's integrated up there, you know. But up there, there's like, there's no protection, is there? It's all, no, it's, everyone's it's, mixed I, in, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so it's all got, open plan. I, so you've got paedophiles mixed in with murderers and all sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, we, we, we were kicking up big stink of that because we were trying to class um, the VR reduction, the violence reduction thing. We were trying to class that. Um, we were trying to put violent people on the same level as um, sex offenders. Well, that's why they brought the IPPs yeah. out, because it's trying to say violent offenders are the same as sexual yeah, offenders. Yeah, the same sort of view. It's completely you, different. How it? can someone that commits violence on another man, I, two like-minded yeah. men, be the same as someone that goes and rapes a two-year-old kid? It's I, not, where, how can they come from there I, to there? You it's kind like, of put them I, in the same category. Definitely, where we had a big kick-off over that, like... Because it's like, no, it's like, he's a class and the same as all the rest of these bacons, you know what I mean? Like, there was some, there was some sick people on there. People who, like, like well, you would put think bodies in freezers and that, and oh. took them back out and defrost them to bump them again. Oh. This was this dude from um, Darlington or somewhere. He was on the news. He kept his, his missus' body in the freezer and he, he was defrosting now, getting her out, like, mates having sex oh. with him. Putting her back in. Putting her back on ice. Sick mate, some really sick people. So what was it like for you then getting put on there and amongst other people? Or other uh, people like that? Wait, well, like like I said it was alright. At first because it was only a couple of us when yeah. it started filling up and it's like and the these really bad offenders started coming on the wing, it was like me and George were like, hold on a second, check this, check this and out, you know what I mean? And the screws would be like, Yeah, look, look at this fella here. He's a right wrong one. Oh, you know what I mean? It's like, right, so you're telling me that obviously you want us to go and him. And it'd be like, so I'd just, I'd end up following the person who was just showing into the room and battering them all over and just walking up the room, leaving them on the floor, you know what I mean? <laughs> so and the screws are off, more or less giving you permission. Yeah, I'll tell you I, to go that's and do what it. it was like. I was getting permission. I was getting permission. But this was only at first when it was all unsettled. Yeah. When, it's, when it filled up and there was loads of tension on it, it was like, no, you know what I mean? I just didn't think the officers knew what to do because obviously we are like segregation schools. So we we technically or necessarily haven't been around them sort of people right, either. Right. The same as us, you know what I mean? Obviously so that's why they're telling you to go surprised. in and do them all. Yeah. But it's not until hindsight till you realise these things. That's what I've found. So it seems strange how they're putting someone, say someone like yourself who's extremely violent, putting you in a, on a... Pipes unit with on a unit with yeah. someone that you hate. Where where you've and got so much freedom to, do to go and do that if you want oh, to. Yeah. It's all it's just all in your choice. Do you want to do that? And if you do want to do it, then can do it. But you'll be gunned down that way. You know. Would you get just... booted off the unit if you get found out? Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. If Obviously, you, if, if, if you're starting as... violence and stuff like that, yeah. like, you're well off there. Uh, but like, no matter how I ended up getting. And is this off when there. you got diagnosed on the unit? Yeah, this is when I got diagnosed. Of course, you had to have two personality disorders to go onto the unit. So, like, I got diagnosed just before I went onto the unit. But then I got a more thorough assessment on there, which gives us definite diagnoses. Did you feel happier when you found out there was something matter? Aye, yeah, because it explained a explained lot. Aye, oh, yeah, it's it's like. <sighs> You know, it's just a weird thing. Like a weird like, lifted really? off thing, this is why I've been acting uh, like this. It's like, wait, so now I can work on it. You know what I mean? Now if I now if something's been identified, yeah. I can actually focus on that and work on it. And that's what I've done. And it's 
it amazes us how much you can switch and take on and learn if you want to. Oh. You know, like you say, if you want to, it's all in that. If you so want what to. was the point for you then in that sentence when, when you were on that unit, like you thought like, I don't want to do this anymore, I want to get out, I want to be free? Well, it was uh, it was that what I was just on about, the, um, the nonsense you and the rapists it? and that. No, I, I was literally like, I was getting a nod sometimes, but then other times I was starting to like identify with myself and go for myself. And, and this one time I was I was we were playing five aside and this and this rape house was down there taking his shin pads off. I was walking past him. I fucking cracked him in his nose with his shin pads on, laid him clean out and just kept on walking. The screws knew it was me. We oh, couldn't right. prove it, they knew it was me, so we put us down on G W D and then like after a couple of weeks he came down and like, listen, when you can gang back up on the unit or you can carry on doing what you're doing and you're just never gonna get out really. Yeah. That's basically how we put it. And I so was like, G -G -O -A -D, is it good, good order, order and discipline? discipline? For the good order and discipline. And that's like when you're in the block on it. Oh, it's like when you're controlling oh, right. So it's up to the governor obviously when he lets you back up on the line. But but the, the difference is when you're on good order and discipline. It's you just down the block. You can still have your own can all your canteen if oh, you want. Right. You can have a radio if you want. You can't have a telly, but you can have your clothes like the luxuries you'd have up on the wing, but just oh, down right. the block. So you're locked in a cell. That's basically what it is. Yeah. So you like didn't associate or you didn't get on the phone or to the mail queues, whichever. And then we're getting back to when you said like that moment when you thought this is enough. Yeah, yeah. That 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 was the moment. It's like I went back up and I was I just looked at it differently and I was like. Do you know what it is? I'm going to knuckle down. I'm going to, because it had been identified, these pieces, it was such a relief. I was like, you know what it is? I'm just going to try and ignore all of these sex offenders around yeah. us. And I'm going to try and focus on me. And then it's like, when I did that, it's like I found out I had an eight-year-old son. So that was like even more motivation right, for us. And, and that was like the moment. I was like, you know what? I'm not doing that life no more. I'm not doing that life no more. Felt really confident, like, building up all the courses and stuff like that, but I hadn't yet done anything outside, which was right. is my which was my biggest like downfall really. And what outside. age were you then when that when you had that moment when you thought that's like maybe twenty five, about twenty five. I, I said twenty three before, but I got mixed up. It was that's when I got diagnosed twenty three. Me epiphany moment didn't happen until I was twenty five, and right. I and I was in that situation where it was like you can go back up or you can go down that way. It was yeah. like given a choice, you know. So. I just thought I'd take it. I was around about the similar age, to be honest, and I was actually in Franklin as well. Oh, yeah, I was on F Wing. I think I, I was about... seeing the incident in the paper oh, right. and thinking, oh, I wonder where this one's off to. <laughs> <laughs> but I was here, yeah, 23 year old in Franklin, and I was lying on my bed and I thought, like, what the fuck am I doing here? Oh, yeah. Everyone's out there having the creating families, working, oh, making right. money. Yeah. I'm sitting having in here with notes. You know, so. Uh, was that your moment? Like, that was my I, moment in the eye when well, I that's thought... That's good though, I'm 23 round though, man. So I, st I struggled just to have my moment, you know what I mean? I, I go through a lot oh, of right. shit just to have my moment, man. It's crazy. You mentioned, um, when I was speaking to you earlier on, you met Shane Taylor. Shane... What? Shane oh, Taylor? Oh, no, oh, I mean, Shane go well back. So where did you meet him, Martin? Well, in, was in he the, the home house. Here? No, no. Shane Taylor, we were in the home house together. Right. Uh, just before... Just before we got done with smashing our coffee jar on the school's face. Right. That incident there. Uh, oh, when he got done with it. Uh, oh, well, right. I went to Crown Court for, as his witness. Because, oh, right. Like, I, I was with him. We both went out, like, I got the pool ball as he went for the school. I didn't know what he was going to do. I mean, you know what I mean? He split the school's face open with a fucking coffee jar. Like, Did he? peeled his face clean open. And I'm standing there with pearl balls thinking, wait, do I fucking chuck these now or what? Oh, right. You know what I mean? I'm thinking, fuck, so I just pelted a couple. And then there was just like mega screws everywhere, you know what I mean? And we both ended up down the block. And I, it, we were talking, he was down the hospital because I broke his wrists and that when they were twisting them up. And I was in the solitary confinement cell, which was right on the end, but the hospital was there and there was a wall between us. And me and, me and Shane were talking, and apparently the screw said that he admitted what he'd done, right? But when I went in the dock for Shane, I'm like, that would be completely impossible for him to talk to me because there's like a big wall there, there's a iron wall there, he's thinking, so I'd have to be like, oh, I says, and then everybody would hear, you know what I mean? <laughs> so they dismissed that part of it, you know what I mean? And he got a few less, but I've heard he's turned to uh, born again Christian. Now, he has, he? I have, uh, 
He's actually going to come on when he gets a bit of time. I've been speaking oh, with him. Aye, aye. Yeah. He, uh, cool. He's turned his life round as well. Aye. But we he, had um, a competition going, you know, me, aye. Shane, and another lad from Shane's area, like, who would be most violent. In right, aye. That, we had, we, we had, had a competition. competition, aye, and it was a <laughs> real competition. And that's and it was like, see what did most damage to schools. And there was three of us. It was him and his mate and me. Crazy time, crazy Shane time. Shane Taylor, if any of the viewers haven't heard of him, yeah, which I'm sure most of you will if you're watching these sort of podcasts. I've, uh, he's done a few podcasts himself, Shane. He's now going into prisons and that. And, uh, oh, is he actually I think he's going and doing that? talks and he's wow. helping other people. But Major Shane term. was um, branded Britain's most dangerous prisoner at one point. I was. Uh... He was in the papers and everything. And um, I think he's got his own boot in that now. I have. have I, uh, I don't think I've read his boot yet. But uh, I've seen a few of his talks and all he does. And, um, right. Yeah, it's crazy. Do you know what? So is Shane, obviously, Shane, did he have that reputation as... Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, people, I swear to God, Shane used to walk in the wing. Everybody used to peel off whatever screws were <laughs> and everywhere used to empty. Now, I think Shane liked me because I never used to do that. I just right. used to, yeah, man, cool. And But I was next door. I was in the next door to us. And we just, we had good, we had good chats and that, and that's right. how we ended up, because we ended up conspiring, egging each other on, uh-huh. and that's how that situation ended up happening. So, like, that situation there where he's peeled the screws, it was like... Right. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> 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 but, so, uh, hey, blah, man, I like that shit. Right. It's, it's a ring from the past. So getting back into the rear, into Franklin on the unit then, where... Um, was it therapy that you were doing? Yeah, um, intensive therapy, like CBT, cognitive thinking, like hand and comfort. And is this like every day? Uh, yeah, Courses it was like, every day. Uh, well, if you signed up with DSP, you had to commit to doing four hours every day for five days a week. For five years. For so, five years? Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah, very, very intensive Intense. therapy. Like, I uh, used to bounce off one course, go straight to another course, and then you'd get locked up and you'd be like... Pfft. You know what I mean? Overwhelmed, overloaded with all this information. Did you ever feel at any point like that? Because I've done them courses myself and it absolutely pickles your brain, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. When you've got homework to do, you've got to go back to your pad and uh, you cannot think about it straight and it's there. Uh, so I can imagine what it must have been like doing that for five years. Very, uh, you know, when I, <coughs> I didn't realise how intensive, how intensive it was until I broke it down like that. You know what I mean? Four hours every day for five years. It's a long That's time. That's a lot of therapy, man. So, because I had to do all the courses, like um, recognize, recognizing personality disorders, um, personality disorder management, emotion regulation, conflict handling, you know, all the courses, you know what I mean? Like, but some of them. You've got to do role players on these courses yes, as well, haven't you? Oh, uh, well, some of these role players, I ended up having to get one on one therapy because in some of these things, they were doing some sick reenactments, you know what I mean? And I, I couldn't oh, stay in the room, I was like, nah. I'm out, and I ended up getting like taught one on one eventually. Like, but see these like these sexual recidivism, these these offenders, they get encouraged. Like, we'll sit there and nod the head. Is oh yeah, we understand. So they tell them everything. You know what I mean? So we're getting a lot of information through psychologists right. nodding the head and smiling right. and just saying oh yeah, you know, and they just and they, they, they take glee from it. It's a different level. Oh, sick different level of oh, like crimes you know so uh, when you were doing these courses could you feel yourself changing as well when it was pickling away at your head and well and I, you back to, did they take you right back to the store when you were right a kid, back to I? school i took us right back to school because it was like some of the things i was in i was like i was saying like some people in in the groups when i was in the group saying why are you telling us that we learned that in primary school but i was sitting there thinking i should have took notice at oh, school like, you know what i mean because if I had known that in this situation, then I would have had this option. Could have but saved yourself I, and other people a lot of Yeah, a lot, a lot of heartache heart and grief because it's not just you who suffers when you get sent. It's all your family, the victims, yeah. people supporting you, your missus who's got to come up and visit, visit you, send you in, blah, 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 you know. Right, so I can imagine, like you say, when you're doing all these courses and it's, you're going back to the start to the... Did they give you a reason when they were going back to the start why you sort of started yeah, doing it? Um, yes, like like I said, it, it, and I recognised when I turned violent. 
I recognised when I turned that switch in my head, I think violence was okay. You know what I mean? It was when I recognised my dad in the hospital and not my mum. I lay and put that down and I said, turn it on, sir. No, I'm sorry. Probably used to miss us. I, it was just a pivot, pivotal moment in my life, like I said. I just, like, violence is recognised, but <clears throat> that's not the norm. Were you finding out things about yourself that you'd, you didn't really realise, obviously? Yeah. It, it was like it was like opening my eyes to something which I should have been exposed to like a long time ago. But Did you start experiencing emotions and that as well? Yeah, where we have done that emotion regulation, recognizing emotions. Me, I was just sitting there thinking I was just doing not the fucking psychopath, only having emotions and feeling violent and happy and sad. You know what I mean? Oh, I didn't realize I had all these emotions in between. <laughs> So I, like, you've got to learn about them and then you've got to try and understand them and you've got to try and find something what makes you feel that way so you can eventually feel it. And that was the thing about the DSPD unit because most of them were lifers and never getting out so they could never put what I had learned into practice so there was no results. And there was me and Nippy Dixon from Liverpool who got out and were the sort of like prodigies for the unit to, to keep, to keep, going, works, to keep the funding going. And uh, Nippy got me called and I'm still out here now, 12 years 12 later. 12 years later. And, and I couldn't see, I can't see I'm a standing testament that the DSPD programme works as long as you knuckle down and, want you want it, and get, you, get and take from it what you want, you know? So when, obviously when you were in there and you started just doing these courses, did you feel like you weren't violent anymore and you didn't want to hurt <clears> anybody? No, but I, I, yeah, I, 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 felt, I felt like... I was scum, I felt like I was a real, real, you know what I mean? It made us look at myself in the light of somebody else. Someone you didn't like. I, yeah, and it was like, you know what it is? No, I, you might have your mothers where you didn't hit women or you didn't hit kids and it's that, you know, but look at all of the shitty stuff you've done. You know what I mean? In my life I've got like 109 convictions, at 36 sentences. It's just all madness and I would... I would love to take it all back, but I wouldn't be in the position I am now and have the knowledge I have now if I hadn't have went down them roads. Yeah. So, in the sense that I do regret my past and stuff like that, I didn't regret You didn't the regret roads. the prison, because I feel I, the same. I didn't like regret prison. You regret all the people you've hurt, all the victims I, along the way, but you didn't regret doing the prison because it's made you who you are. Yeah, exactly. And it exactly. could have been a lot worse if you didn't nip it in the board and get sent to prison. Yeah. It could have been murder, the next step. Well, well that's what I mean. Like, with the people I used to not about with, they just used to be, oh, go on, you didn't do it, you didn't do it. And it's like, really? Go on, I'd like to see you do it. Oh, you, you know what I mean? And then it doesn't get done. And that's a true and you thing. You always the one that would take it to the next high. level. Yeah, I'll, yeah, that's it. Aye. You'll always be the one to take it to that next level where everybody just splits from. Aye. And then you're left there suffering the consequences. And then them same people. And they were to be seen when you go to prison. Or I was near, nah, you never oh, see money. People who stay. You didn't get letters. You didn't get money nah. sent. Then you didn't. You know who you met to when you got to oh, prison. That's that's for sure. And there's not many sticks nah. by you, is there? You just there's always just that one or two. You know that old person who's always asking your mum if you're getting on all right, right. You know what I mean? I know people. All people can't go out of way to write into prison or to go into prison, but it doesn't matter. Just a little letter, or just ask after us, or just pop a random tenor in the post yeah. just to let me know that you're thinking about us. Right. Like you were at the time, <laughs> you know? But it's not like that, is it, in reality? It's a, it's a harsh reality, man. So coming up to the end of your years, was it eight and a half years? Yeah, uh, I eight and a half you years. You had like a That's, release date. I, How were you feeling leading up to your release date? Very nervous because <laughs> I... because Did they have a plan for you coming out? Yeah. Did they put but, things in place and everything? Well, that's what they made us believe, you know, you know what I mean? And I had a CPN for like about, about six weeks. But I got, out, I got out of that prison, the man I wanted to be, you know what I mean? I'd built myself up, like after it brought you down, they'd leave you and then they'd give you all the courses to build yourself up into the person you want to be. Yeah. And also I got out, I got out, I was, I was getting nervous and that, like, but I was getting confident. I was like, you know what I mean? I knew where I was going, I had my five year plan. I had my five-year plan, which I completed in three years, you know what I mean, because I was focused on it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I had my five-year plan, I had, I had a job waiting for us, I knew which way I was gone, and I'm still gone 
from them tools I learnt now, but all just rusty. So I need I need refreshing courses, which I've been literally begging them for because I've had a few incidents over time since I've been out and I've struggled a little bit. But I, I go straight and I say, listen, I'm struggling. What shall I do now? Most of the time they just go and we'll have a look in your bag and shut the door. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's so hard for a person who's struggling after they've asked for help. You know what I mean? Have the door shut in your face. The crisis team won't even talk to me because I'm a stage two or level two or something. I didn't even know what that means. Right. You know, it's like, oh, what's your name? I tell them my name and they're like, no, I'm sorry, but can't deal with you. And that's just because I've got personality disorders. But when you get released from prison, after you've, especially when you've been in a long time, the gates open, normally your family's waiting there. You're excited to get out. Yeah. But for you? I had the police waiting there for me and uh, the this, this CID and... I, I couldn't even step outside the gate, even though I was getting released. It was like I was getting even told you were the police station. The police and handcuffs, and I'm like, well, what's going on? I'm like, well, this is how we've got to transport you because no prisoners get released from Franklin. So it says, this is how we've got to transport you until you get to the hospital. Uh, the hostel. And I'm like, oh, all right, then. So I just <laughs> rode along. Going right? jail or something. I just rode along <laughs> thinking these are trying to really trick me. I'm going to be roped into some police station either along the way. But no, they took us in the hostel, took the cuffs off and went. Well, they're all right with you in the journey on the way Aye, there Yeah, stuff. yeah, they were just asking us questions and stuff like that. I didn't realise what was going on, but I was on something that was called MAP Level 3, like multi agency like the most, Public the Protection level Association. The That's where all the agencies, like, say, probation, school, social services, the authorities, the civic centre, all that, they all, like, share the information about you. They all sit down in a room, the heads of all the different departments all sit down in the room, discuss you, talk about you, and... and See where they want, which way they want you to go, and you're under surveillance. I was under surveillance for the first eight months. Oh, yeah. Right. I, with, I was going to my mum's, I was going to my mum's. <clears throat> After I'd left, 20 minutes later, I got a phone call, Wayne. I'm like, what? She's like, the police have just been here. I'm like, well, what for? She's like, asking how your behaviour was, asking if you were violent, asking if we need panic buttons. I'm like, what? I mean, they've done all of this before I got out. Got oh, out, yeah. we went under the family and asked if. Just I, to make sure. I, just to make sure, like. But like, I'm not even them, man, you know? Right. But be because of the stigma of these PDs. And how long were you in the hostel, did you say? Yeah, I was in the hostel for about eight months. Right. Uh, and, then, and, then I met, and then I met this last, because I ended up staying over Gateshead, so I, I met this last from over Gateshead. And I had, I had a child with her, Jacob. And he's now got autism, high functioning autism and ADHD. And I'm think I look at him and I think I was the same as that when I was a kid. And I'm thinking, if I was a kid now, I would have been diagnosed a lot earlier. Do you think he's maybe inherited something from you? Yeah, I, I don't think it's it's nothing being around us because I haven't been around him that much to have that much of an influence on. Him. I have got a big influence on him, but just some of his mannerisms and just some of the things he right. does is like quirky things. And it's like, yeah, I used to do that when I was a kid. Oh, only my mum says, oh. <laughs> I'll be seeing doctors when I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> so did you go on to meet another last the one that you married now? Yeah, uh, yeah. We we had Jacob, and then two years later, it just wasn't working out. We just went on the same. We went on the same page, and then I met Gemma, my wife now, who I met while I was in Franklin DSPD. Actually, she was me my brother's friend, and she ended up in Law Newton next door for um, somebody attacked her sister. And she, she hit the attacker, but she had glass in her hand. Right. So it split the attacker's face. She ended up getting the 18 months. And that's, I ended up writing her from there and just like giving her a little bit of advice just to help her along our road, you know. And we just ended up chatting Pen from there. Oh. I had pen pals and she got out. She'd come up and visit and that, bringing us a bit sun and, sun and kit in and that. And then I was just like, listen, Gemma, <clears throat> I've still got eight years left. This is not reality. Go and live your life. Yeah. Because I'd done a lot of jail, so I knew the jail. I was like, go and live your life. If you're still interested when I get out, I'll see you then. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and she's always kicking herself, thinking, oh, wait, if I'd just got on you when I got out, it would have been <laughs> lots of hours. I would, we wouldn't have been here right now, doing yeah. what we're doing, living the life we're living. It just wouldn't have happened. So you end up getting married? I am getting married uh, five years ago. And oh, nice one. It's, <laughs> just, it's just all positive. Like, if I'm, if I'm getting off track, you know what I mean? Gemma's... I mean, she can't control us, nobody can control us, but she can give us positive words, which I want need to hear in yeah. certain moments, you know what I mean? And you just need that person, that guidance, who can guide you, who's yeah. a sound mind, who can guide you in the right direction when you're not going there, you know? So, and I do trust Gemma to 
to do that and be yeah. that person for us. Hence why I'm out there. Oh, it's good that you've got a uh, good lady behind you because uh, we all need a good lady behind yeah, us to uh, keep us on the street and our end. <laughs> Definitely. I am a big advocate for what you're doing here. Like, it's oh, like really nice good stuff, like, need to be. Like you're saying, yeah, if you're helping people yourself by talking to people, people that's gone off the real, you're doing good yourself, you know. That's what I mean. It just looks like you were thriving off, off that, off oh, helping people, you know what I mean? And, and it's great to see, man. It's, it's meant to see. Well, you could maybe come you. along to the mental health group that I've got here in the gym. Yeah. You might even have some knowledge that you can pass up and you can help other people. I still need a lot you know of knowledge I mean? myself as well, oh. you know what I mean? So I, I'll tack you up on that, man, I'll come along. So what's life like <coughs> for you at the minute? What do you... Um, I know you say you're a lot of carp fishing, is it? I have to fill your time in. Uh, it's like when I'm getting a bit bored of my same surroundings or me and hers getting at each other, I'll just say, yeah, you know, I'm getting myself off carp fishing for a couple of days. And I just go and book on some uh, syndicate or something, you know what I mean? Just spend a couple of days on there fishing. Do you come out as well piece. when you. Eh? Do you come out when you're doing oh, it? I've got full bivy oh, 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 full bivy alarms, and rods, oh, rigs, oh, yes, oh, oh, slings a lot, mate. I'll show you some. I'll show you some fish after. Like I've got oh, some, right. I've had some beauties. Like nothing far away now down Houston. Right. Oh, right. in the rough. There's some good ones in there. So obviously it's something that you really enjoy doing. Uh, is yeah, it? Yeah, I was a bailiff down there. I was a bailiff down the rough, but I can't manage it this year because I've got disabilities. Like I've got DBT in this leg off working, and I can't. It's like five hundred meters there and five hundred meters back, and you've got you've got your barrel, you've got all yeah. your bivy, your alarms, your bed, everything. You know what I mean? I just our three fails through the woods, <coughs> down and up banks, and when I come back from my session, I'm absolutely exhausted, so I'm thinking about moving to a different pond at the minute. <laughs> so you've been out of prison 12 years, and I, um, I bet, like when you're out doing this fishing and stuff, prison never leaves you, now people say, forget about prison, but I never when leave, I'm out yeah. do, for walks and stuff, clearing my head, and I'm like, I always think about the prison and appreciate that I'm out in the fresh air. Yeah. Aye. Wait, you mentioned that. I had a drink. Uh, I had a drink of just juice the other day, fresh, cold, <laughs> right, a bit of juice the other day, and I was just looking at my wife. I went, Do you know what I was asking? Every day, I appreciate grateful. The, I'm right. grateful for the things I've just got around us. Right, I mean, it being able to open and shut the door yourself, you know what I mean? Right. Having time to, to choose what you want to do when you want to do it, you know? But, and it's good to still have that because. What normally happens is when the lads come out and our few lads that's been recalled lately, people that I was yeah, inside with, aye. people from this local area, um, they get out and they're in the same mindset I was in, like they, they want to change their lives, they want things better for themselves, but then it slowly creeps back in, they forget about it. and They, they, they start knocking it, about it with old friends again, and aye. that, aye. Whereas me, like you've just mentioned yourself, every day I'm grateful for being free, I'm grateful yeah. for just being out and having a happy life. I don't. I didn't know if you found me, but what I found, I had to take myself away from all of my mates. Oh, all of me, I had to, like isolate myself. I'm like, listen, I'm, I'll, I'll see you later, yeah, all right, but yeah. I'm not nothing about you oh, because I'm not wear guns. You know yeah. what I mean? You just eliminating all them things. What can do that? But I found once I'd done that, I was left with like one or two friends yeah. out of like twenty. You know what I mean? So it'd be like, and then and then when you weren't living in that life, they start turning against you. A bit later oh, yeah. on, you know what I mean. It's, but when you become at peace with yourself, happy yeah. with yourself, you wake up every day in Beautiful. a good mood, don't you? Yeah, uh, you do. Life's a lot better in it. That's what I mean. I can see you thriving off off this. Oh, it, it must be great. It, it must is, be great. Right. Really good. But yeah, uh, Wayne, thank you very much for coming on me. But yeah, um, oh, it's been a pleasure. I'll come to one of your groups. Nice one. But I'm we're going to finish on the um, one question that I always ask me guests at the end. I'll yeah. just. What would you say to the young ones now? Like, looking back at your old self, what advice would you give to the kids now? The ones that are going off the rails and... Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say, in reality, you need to stick at your school and not follow your friends because yeah. peer pressure, everything... I, I reckon that's like 90% of why most people are committing these common crimes because people are egging them on to do yeah. it. But you've just got to be your own person, be you. Didn't exactly. it be? Didn't it be what everybody else wants you to be? Just be you. That that would be my advice. <laughs> Brilliant, mate. But thank you very much for coming on. We had pleasure. Cheers. Thanks. Being good.